Okay, so um, we're going to continue to work through lecture set number 13. The material from this point onward is more or less, I'm, I mean, certainly the material from this point onward is um, extra material. So this is, these are questions or these are concepts that can be tested on the final exam. And you will see examples of in the practice problems for the final exam. But they're not concepts that are going to be tested on the assignments via either the lab or the um, lecture. In lecture set 13, we are studying multiple linear regression models. So we are looking at models where the response variable can be the function of multiple explanatory values. In our initial examples, we have focused on situations where the response variable and the explanatory variables are continuous or quantitative values. In our first illustration, for example, we linked um, a taste score for cheeses to their composition in terms of their acidity uh, the amount of uh, like lactic amounts that they contain and um, uh, I think it was like sulfur dioxide or something like this. In the second example, we linked the price of a grandfather clock, so an antique clock, to the um, uh, age of the clock and the number of people that have bidded on the clock. So these again were continuous values or quantitative values, quantitative values. Technically bidders would not be continuous, it would be discrete. Now in the second illustration, when we talked about this relationship between the price and those other two variables, we also included, <coughs> we also included an interaction term. And this interaction term allowed us to um, effectively give additional or add additional flexibility into the model. So try and incorporate for a relationship that could exist between um, X and, or between the two explanatory values. Thank you. In our next set of um, topics in the MLR unit, we're gonna talk about the incorporation of what is called a dummy variable. And the idea here is that we want to account for not only vari for variables that are not only quantitative, but also variables that are qualitative. So for example, in the most general case, suppose that you wanted to build a linear model to estimate the height of a certain person or the heights of a population of people. We can take into account, for example, their age and their weight. These would be naturally correlated variables, but you might also want to take into account the gender of the student, of that person, because um, accounting for whether they are male or female, for example, might be beneficial to us in trying to predict the height. But obviously, gender is not quantitative. It's a qualitative variable by um, design or by description, like you are either in this category or you're in the other category if it's a two category variable. So the dummy variables within an MLR model are what allow us to incorporate the information from these categorical measurements. So the illustration that we are going to use to um, study the inclusion of these dummy variables is based off of um, a study of plants. So we have one response variable and two explanatory variables. The response variable is the number of flowers that have appeared on a meadow, a meadow foam plant. One of the explanatory values is light intensity. The other explanatory value is what we are calling light timing. Okay. When we look at the design, you can see light intensity has effectively six levels associated with it. The 150, the 300, the 450, the 600, the 750, the 900. 
These are quantitative values. Now, one might argue that you could consider those as being separate levels on their own. So you would, you know, fix at 150, 300, 450, 600. But you could also argue that we could use the line to predict the response variable based off of a light intensity that fell in between one of those categories. So suppose you had a light intensity of 300 and a light intensity of 450, but you wanted to study the effect of a light intensity of 375. Well, you could plug 375 in and that would still have meaning as a value on its own. So we can treat the light intensities as a quantitative continuous variable and not lose any sense of meaning by doing that. However, the light timings are early or late. There's no quantitative representation of this. These are a qualitative variable, but we still want to include this in the model. So we have to design our MLR model to intake information from this qualitative variable. Okay, so in this design, we have a number of plants, these metafoam plants, and we're counting the number of flowers on these plants, okay? So our data can be represented in the following table. So you can see that we have multiple replications for each of the different timing slash intensity sessions. So our response variables can be effectively just all of these values together. So it can be the 62.3, the 77.4, the 55.3, the 54.2, the 49.6, and the 61.9, et cetera. Okay. So now you can see or in on slide 29, we have a scatter plot that shows the number of flowers versus the light intensity at each of the timing schedules. So you can see that we have a situation where the points are stacked because we have four different replications at each of the intensity schedules, right? So this is for 150, this is for uh, 300, should be a little more centered. Right. This is for 425, I guess. Oh, 450. Here is 600, 750, I assume, and 900. Okay, so our goal here is basically to model the number of flowers as a function of light intensity and the light timing schedule. So we want to take into account all of these things at once. Right now, the situation that we find ourselves in is actually a simple linear regression. Or if we consider this, the light timing separately, we're in a situation where we would actually have two separate SLR models. So we could have, for example, an SLR model for the late schedule, and we could have an SLR model for the early schedule. But we want to incorporate both that both sets of timing at, into the same model. So we can have one general model to explain the entire situation rather than two separate SLR models for each of the timing schedules. Okay. But again, the tricky part is that one of the variables is not continuous, it's categorical. All right, so the inclusion of a categorical variable is actually pretty straightforward. Essentially, what you do is for each level of the categorical variable, you create a, a dummy variable. So in our situation, we have two levels, so we only need one dummy variable. The dummy variable assigns one of the categories to be what we call a reference level, and the other category to be what we would call the um, active level, if you will. So the reference level always takes on a value of zero, and then the other level will take on a value of one. So essentially all we're doing is we're taking something that is categorical. So in our case, late versus early. 
we're letting all of the lates be a value of one, all of the earlies being a value of zero. So we're basically just introducing a binary variable into the system. So we're creating a quantitative measurement where zero one represent the difference between the levels of that variable. Okay. So in our situation, we're gonna have yi be the number of flowers on the plants. So that's our response. X1 is gonna be the light intensity. So the values that we saw on the X axis of the previous plot or those six different levels that we discussed before. And X2 is going to be the categorical dummy variable. So it's gonna be a one or a zero, depending on if the plant was exposed to the late light or the early light. Okay, so I wanted to skip forward to show you what the data is actually gonna look like now. So, and then I'm gonna go back to the previous slide. Okay, so this is our actual matrix of values for the experiment. So this is like what you would see in SPSS, for example. So you can see that we've basically just stacked all of the response variables together. So you can see that you have 150 occurring four different times due to the replication and due to the fact that we expose the intensity at the different schedules. And this is true for all of the intensities, right? So you have 300 occurring four different times. You have 450 occurring four different times, et cetera. But then you can see that what's happening in the last column, so X2 here, this is just our dummy variable representation of timing. So we are taking late and making it a zero and taking early and making it a one. So if X2 is equal to zero, it means that the plant was in the late light. If X2 is equal to one, it means the plant's in the early light. So we're just assigning a value of zero or one to those outcomes. Right. Okay, so what influence does this actually have on the model? Well, the general model can now have two different sort of functions, if you will. So we have yi equals beta zero plus beta one x one plus beta two x two i plus some error. Okay, so x two is a zero or a one. If x two is equal to zero, so if we're in the late light group, our model simply reduces to y equals beta zero plus beta one x i. So we just have an SLR model pop out where you're not in, you're not even taking into consideration the effect of the reference group. If x two is equal to one, you can see that you now have a beta two term here and that gets absorbed into the intercept. So what we're actually doing by incorporating the dummy variables are creating sets of parallel lines. So it's interesting because if you go back to the original scatter plot and, I'm, and I said to you, okay, you know, like if you look at this data set, you basically have a model for the early time and a model for the late time. These are like two SLR models. By building an MLR model with the dummy variable, you actually just return this. So it's the same idea. You're basically just adjusting the intercepts of the model, but you have the same slopes relating the, um, uh, the, the quantitative measurements. Okay, so this is what our model is actually gonna look like for our particular study. So the red line here, this is going to be yi hat is equal to b0 plus b1 xi. And the green line here, this is going to be yi hat is equal to b0 plus b2 plus b1 xi. Now, what's great about this is that the interpretation of the coefficients is so straightforward. When we looked at interaction, we noticed that interpreting the interaction coefficient is very difficult because it actually influences the slope or the relationship of the response with the categorical variable that we are not controlling for. So every time we switch or change a value of x of x2 for illustration sake, you're, you're influencing the relationship between y and x1. 
with the inclusion of a dummy variable, the only thing that you're adjusting is the parallel line. So the slope has the exact same interpretation in both the reference and um, non-reference section. So it's the exact same slope for both the early and the late group in this case. The only thing that's changing is the y-intercept. So the only thing that we have to account for is the fact that when x1 is equal to zero, your y-intercept bumps up by a factor of, B, of b2. So it's a very simple idea. Replace the, um, the categorical quantity with a zero or a one. It doesn't matter which one you call the reference group and which one you don't, you get the same result out. And from there, interpretation is pretty much gonna be exactly the same as it was in the, um, in the, in the simplest case, the SLR case. Okay, so the true line or the fitted line has the equation shown on slide 34. So we're being asked two questions. What is the y-intercept for the late group? What is the y-intercept for the early group? Okay, so we said when x equals zero, plants are in late group, right? So when x equals one, plants are in early group. Just gonna make sure. Okay, okay so the y-intercept for the late group is going to be 71.3058. The y-intercept for the early group is going to be 71.3058 plus 12.1583. So this is going to be 1, carry the 1, 4, carry the 1, 6, 4, 3, 8. Okay. So it's pretty straightforward. Any questions so far? Okay, so what we have learned is when you shift from the reference group to the non-reference group, you have an increase of 12.1583, right? So that's the, B, the B2 value right here, okay? So what we can say is that plants that receive early light are expected to produce 12.1583 more flowers than plants that receive the late light on average. So what B2 is, so the coefficient for the categorical variable, it represents the change in expected output from the reference level to the non-reference level, right? So this point here is saying that B2 represents change in Y, between uh, x equals x2 equals zero and x2 equals one. So it's actually very similar to a slope, except that the slope is talking about change in y over a one unit increase in x. For a categorical variable, the coefficient is just talking about change in y as you switch between the levels of x. Does 
the slope term, so the relationship between light intensity and the number of flowers is consistent across um, both models or for both reference levels. So B1, is just telling us that as the light intensity increases, we expect the number of flowers that grow to reduce by negative 0.0450. So for every unit light intensity goes up, we expect to see a decrease in the number of flowers equal to negative 0 0.045, 0 0.0405. The, B, the B0, which is the slope of the model, this is telling us the expected number of flowers that will grow when there is no light intensity and when you have late light. So B0 is telling us the expected value of Y when you are in the reference group and the light intensity is equal to zero. And then finally, B0 plus B2, which is the intercept for the early group, is telling us the expected number of flowers that will grow when light intensity is zero and you're in the early light group. So all of the parameters of the model have a very straightforward interpretation, which is one of the great things about how we include the dummy variables within the MLR context. Any questions? Okay, so we have seen examples that show us interaction between two quantitative variables. What we're going to move to next is interaction between one quantitative variable and a qualitative variable. And we're going to study how that interaction influences the interpretation of the models. One of the great things is that what we'll actually see is that when you interact or when you consider interaction between a quantitative and a qualitative variable, it's actually a very straightforward interpretation compared to the two quantitative variables. So we can find very easy to define parameters when we mix the, inner, the quantitative and the qualitative variable. Now, before I introduce that, I just wanna mention that the example that we saw used one dummy variable when we had a, a qualitative variable with two levels. When you have qualitative variables that have more than two levels associated with them, so for example, x is equal to um, blue, green, red, right? So suppose that you have a value that has more than two, uh, two levels. The way that we deal with that is we create k minus one dummies. So every time you add a level into the qualitative variable, you have to have that number of level minus one dummy variables. So we would have x1 is one if blue, zero if green, x2 is equal to one if red, zero if green, for example. So you pick one of the outputs to be the reference level, and then you create that reference level has to be consistent across X1 and X2. And then the red and the blue outputs are the non-reference level for each of those. Okay, so we're gonna look at the inclusion of the interaction term next. 
just before we get there, we're going to consider what we have seen, what we know to be true about the models, and then we're going to talk about whether or not we actually think there would be a purpose in including interaction. We have already discussed interaction diagrams. So we have looked at situations where basically we have said, if you have parallel lines, it doesn't appear like the sources are interacting, so we shouldn't mix them. And then we've said, if they appear to be parallel, then we should, or they appear to be perpendicular or non-parallel, then that indicates there could potentially be an interaction. For the fitted model, if we consider each group separately, we have the following output. Okay, so this is our simple linear regression model for the early group. And this is our simple linear regression model for the late group here and here. If you recall from the scatter plot, okay, so we have light intensity and we have flowers here, right? We basically had a line like this and then we had a line like this. You can see that the slopes of the two lines are apparent are about equal, right? So while it is possible that we interact the um, the light intensity with the light timing schedule, do we actually think it would be worth it here? And in this situation, we would have to say no, given the slopes are almost identical, we therefore have a system with two parallel lines, right? Yeah, you can use whatever you want as the reference level. Um, you just have to be consistent. Like in this case, I chose late as the reference level. I could have done it for early. The results would have been exactly the same. It's just that B2 would have been negative instead of positive. So it, it's up to you. So we can evaluate the need for an interaction model in the SLR case in the same way that we did for the two-way ANOVAs. We can basically just look at how the lines are relating to each other at each of the reference levels. And if we see that the lines are parallel, that basically implies that there's no um, interaction. And if we see the lines are not parallel, that would imply that there is interaction. So in this particular experiment, including an interaction term is probably not worth it. However, you could also argue that until you actually test it, so in, until you try and verify it from a statistical point of view, you should at least consider it in the model. So we can include interaction by adding in the additional term. So now we have light intensity, right? You have light timing, and then you have the mixture of both. All right. So what's helpful about this is that when you have the interaction term between the light timing and the light intensity, like I was saying before, the uh, interaction of a categorical and a qualitative variable is not nearly as complicated as the interaction of two quantitative variables. So we can actually get a very real interpretation about how light intensity influences the response variable from this interaction model. So we're gonna use the same declarations that we had before. So for X2, when, um, when X2 is equal to zero, we're using late light. When X2 is equal to one, we're using early light. Okay, so X2 equals zero is late. X2 equals one is early. All right, so for the proposed model and the model that we are actually fitting here, we have a general interpretation of the values, right? So B0 is gonna be the expected number of flowers on the plant when X1 is equal to zero and X2 is equal to zero. Beta one is going to be the change 
in the number of flowers every time light intensity increases by one unit when x2 is equal to zero. Beta 2 is going to be the difference between the number of flowers that appear on the plants between the early and the light timing schedules. And then beta 3 is going to be a term that changes the slope of the line when x2 is equal to 1. So beta 3 plus beta 1 will give us the slope of the number of flowers that appear on the plants with respect to light intensity when you're in the early group. So again, what, what's nice about this interaction term is that we have such a useful interpretation for the term beta 3. It's basically just a difference in slope values between late and early light. All right. So for the fitted model, we can say the following. So we have B0 is equal to 71.623. So for plants exposed to late light, we expect to observe 71.623 flowers when light intensity is zero. Right. So again, B0 is just the, the intercept for the model. So it's just telling us how the value of y when everything in the system is zero. So everything in the system being zero means no light intensity and late light because we set late light to be x2 is equal to zero. B1, which is 0 0.041076. Okay, so this is the slope relating light intensity to the number of flowers when you're in the late light group. Okay, so for plants exposed to late light, we expect that the number of flowers will increase by 0 0.041076 for each unit increase in light intensity. Okay, so B1 is telling us this, the relationship between the response variable and X1, which is light intensity, when you're in the reference group, okay? So this is strictly for the case where X2 is equal to zero. Okay, so B2 represents the change in the y-intercept term when you shift from late to early light. So what we would say here is we expect plants in the early light group to produce 11.523 more flowers than plants in the late light group on average. Okay, so B2 is simply just the number of additional plants that we would expect to see in the early light group compared to the late light group. Um, 
and that would be consistent actually across any light intensity. Yeah. Uh, wait, would it be so? No. Uh, when light intensity is zero. Yeah, so that would only be true when light intensity is zero. Because otherwise, if, if the lines are parallel, it would be consistent across every light intensity, but they're not exactly parallel, but they're very close. Okay, B3 is 0 0.00. .00 One zero. Okay, so B three is effectively the difference in the slopes of the two of the between the two light intensity schedules. So, what we're saying here is for every unit increase in light intensity, we expect plants in the early light group to produce 0 0.001210 more um, more flowers than plants in the late late group. Any questions? Oh, wait, I made a mistake here. This value is negative. So this should be decreased by. So B0 is the y-intercept when all the entire system is zero. B1 is the slope relating y to x1 when x2 is zero. B2 is the difference in y-intercepts and B3 is the difference in slopes in each case, B2 and B3 are the differences between the levels of the um, categorical variable. Right. So here is our um, fitted system. Um, so here we have X2 equals zero. And here we have the system where X2 is equal to one. So this red line here is going to be y i hat is equal to 71.623 minus 0.041 x i. And the green line here, this is going to be y i hat is equal to the sum of b0 and b2. So that's going to be 
73.146 repeating, or sorry, 83.146 repeating. minus, and then we have 0 0.41, uh, I'll just write it out like this because I don't know exactly. So that'll be 0 0.041076 plus 0 0.001210 times x1. I. Okay. Now you can see in black here, we have the parallel line. Okay, it's a little bit hidden, but in black is the parallel line. So this would be the line with the same slope as uh, is written in red. Okay, so this is with slope, so parallel line. has slope negative 0 0.041, okay? And you can see that the, the uh, green line, which is the line when x2 is equal to one, it's very, very similar to the parallel line. So again, what this is showing us is simply that even if we include the interaction term, and we, we really went through this practice of just understanding how to interpret the interaction model when you have a quantitative and a categorical variable, but even if we include that information, those that line that line slope is so close to the parallel line that it would be very very surprising if we found any statistical evidence of an interaction in this case uh does anyone have any questions Oh, it's the same as the, it's the same slope as the red line. So the slope negative 0 0.041. Same as the red line. But, okay, so again, we can see that from a visual inspection, there really isn't any evidence that there's an interaction. So mixing the two variables doesn't really seem necessary in this case, but we can still actually test for it um, in a number of ways. So for example, we could test if the interaction term is, is needed using, for example, a t-test, or we could do the extra sum of squares f test between the model with interaction and the model without interaction, similar to what we did in the previous illustration where we were studying the uh, grandfather clocks. Okay, so <clears throat> we are going to use that extra sum of squares F test to determine if we actually require the interaction term. Okay, so to set that up, we have a reduced model, which will be the model without interaction. And we have the full model, which will be the model with interaction. Um, hold on a second here. All right, so what we are testing here 
I'm not really a big fan of this, but is that uh, the reduced model is adequate versus HA that the full model is required. All right. Um, okay, so we're going to test at the 0 0.05. Okay, so we know that the test statistic for the extra sum of squares F test is going to be SSE reduced minus SSE full. Yeah, it's going to have more divided by DFE reduced minus DFE full divided by SSE full over, actually I need to check that one. One second, yeah. The SSE reduced is going to be bigger. So this is, Probably going to be reduced over DFE reduced. Should just verify that though. Mm. Ah, I was right the first time. Pull on the bottom. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of take it off the deep end a little bit here. Two minutes left. Um, all right, well, the, the point is that we, we want, we know that the interaction is probably really weak um, in the con in this particular experiment. And we can see that just by visually studying the system. What we're doing now is effectively just building the formal hypothesis test to see if we need the interaction term. We can actually do this in two ways via the extra sum of squares F test or via the T test about B3. The purpose of the, the example that I'm working through right now is to show you how those tests are related to one another when you only have one additional term in the system. But uh, the problem that I've run into here is just that I only have a minute or two left and setting that up is going to take me way more than a minute. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop here for now. And then on Wednesday, when we return to class, I can pick it up from here and I can show you how those two tests are related. So you can get insight into the relationship between the T test and the, the corresponding F test. Okay. It's actually a pretty interesting relationship. So it's worth putting the time into it. Um, okay, so with that being said, um, that brings us to the end of today's lecture. We have Easter break. So Friday and Monday are observed holidays, which means that we don't have lecture. So we won't have lecture again until next Wednesday. So our final three lectures are Wednesday the 5th or Wednesday the 7th, April 7th, Friday, April 9th, and then Monday, April 12th. So we should be able to finish this up by Friday, I would imagine. So that'll give us about a lecture and a half uh, for review before the final. Um, and our last assignment is moved until April 6, which is Tuesday. So you have until April 6 for the lecture assignment. And I think the lab assignments are due this evening. Um, and quiz three was released last night. So you have pretty much all the grades um, that you, you have most of your grades going into the final or going into the last week of the semester, I should say. So if you guys have any questions, please let me know. And otherwise, I guess I'll speak to you next week on Wednesday.